Hello Internet! This is the third part in our series about the free boson. I will link the previous parts in the description below. Last time we looked at the real-valued Fourier modes of our field that describe standing wave oscillations. This time we will switch to the Hamiltonian framework and take a new look at these oscillations in phase space. This will lead us to the definition of more sophisticated variables that take complex values and that combine the notions of amplitude and phase of an oscillation. We will slowly go through this quite basic material that is usually not discussed at length in courses on field theory. I think it's good to look at things carefully, but tell me in the comments whether you like this degree of detail. Let's go! Last time we expanded our periodic field phi in terms of its Fourier series, which gave us a new set of variables to describe the field. These were the Fourier modes uppercase A. We have the zero mode A0 and for each natural number K we have a cosine and a sine mode AK. In the framework of classical physics these variables are real valued functions of time. We could also find the general solution to the classical equations of motion and I have copied the solution here. Importantly, we found that the individual modes are completely independent from each other. And for each mode, the general solution depends on two real-valued constants of integration. These constants are fixed by specifying initial conditions for the field. These modes uppercase A that we defined are easy to visualize. For example, here we are looking at the behavior of a field when all coefficients except the first sine mode are zero. So only A1 sine is non-zero here. However, this description is not really something to write home about because it's not elegant at all. What I mean is we have these separate cosine and sine functions of time, for example, that describe exactly the same oscillation mode, the only difference being that the sine functions describe an oscillation that starts a quarter period later in time. And very similar for the cosine and sine functions of space. The sine functions can be regarded as the same as the cosine functions, just shifted in space by a quarter of a wavelength. It's not at all elegant to have to carry around these different functions, especially if we consider that our spatial dimension is a closed circle on which the choice of origin is quite arbitrary. And so also what we consider a sine or a cosine mode of space is equally arbitrary. We would really prefer a description that unifies the treatment of these shifted modes. We will achieve this unification by changing to new sets of dynamical variables. However, first we will need to move to a formalism that gives us greater freedom of choice in the dynamical variables that we use to describe our system. So far we have been using the formalism of Lagrangian mechanics, where we started out by defining an action S in terms of a Lagrangian function L. And this Lagrangian function L can in general depend, as I have schematically denoted here, on a set of coordinates Q and their corresponding velocities or time derivatives Q dot. In our case, the Qs would be the modes A0, A cosine 1, A cosine 2, and so on going over all the cosine and sine modes that we have defined. And the Q dots would be their corresponding time derivatives. In this formalism, you can then use the variational principle of stationary action to get to second order equations of motion for these coordinates. And we did this 
by writing down the Lagrange equations of the second kind for our Fourier modes. The Lagrangian formalism already affords some freedom in our choice of variables because we can always do a so-called point transformation that replaces the coordinates qi by functions of these coordinates. And this works as long as these functions are well behaved enough. However, what we cannot change is that in order to apply the variational principle of stationary action, the q dots must be the time derivatives of the coordinates q. We have already seen a hint that there should actually be more freedom in our choice of variables. Recall that once we have derived the second order equations of motion, we need to specify initial conditions in order to fix the full evolution of the field. These initial conditions consisted in specifying the value of the field and the value of its time derivative on a Cauchy surface. These could be specified to be two independent arbitrary functions. When we translate this to our Fourier modes uppercase A, it means that as initial conditions we need to specify the values of all the uppercase A's and the values of all the time derivatives of the uppercase A's at a time t1. And we can choose the values of the A's and of their time derivatives completely independently from each other. We may regard this as a hint that there should be a formalism in which we have twice as many independent variables as we have coordinates q. And indeed such a formalism exists. It is called Hamiltonian mechanics and its central object is the Hamiltonian function h, which is a function of the coordinates q and their conjugate momenta p. And in the Hamiltonian formalism the coordinates and the momenta are considered independent variables which can be transformed independently from each other. Mathematically we get from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian function by doing a Legendre transform. The momenta pi are initially defined as the conjugate momenta that we have already seen which are partial derivatives of the Lagrangian function by the corresponding q dot. The conventional notation we are using can be somewhat confusing at first because q dot is used for two different but related notions. If we are looking only at the Lagrangian function itself and for example when we are taking its partial derivative then the q dots are regarded simply as additional independent variables that the function depends on. However, as soon as we plug the Lagrangian function into the action in order to calculate the action integral and use it in the variational principle, it is understood that q dot i is the time derivative of the coordinate function qi. So let's calculate the Legendre transform in order to get the Hamiltonian function for our field. I have copied the Lagrangian function that we calculated last time up here. And now we will calculate h according to the Legendre transform, which is defined as follows. The function h is the sum over all pairs pi times qi dot, where the index i is simply running over the index of all the generalized coordinates that we are using, minus the Lagrangian function L, where it is understood that both in the first part and also in L, the qi dots, which are the variables that we will be getting rid of, uh, shall be re-expressed in terms of the new variables we are using, which are the qi's and the pi's. Where the pi's are defined as follows. Each pi is 
defined as the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qi dot. These are called the conjugate momenta and we have already calculated these for all of our coordinates the last time. So let's simply plug everything in to calculate our Hamiltonian function. The first term in the sum will be for the zero mode and we have here the momentum pi zero for the zero mode. So we have uh, pi zero times the corresponding q dot and that is in our case a zero a naught dot. Um, we will immediately, immediately re-express this in terms of the new variable pi naught and so it's simply pi naught over TL, which means we have pi naught squared over TL, pi naught being a function of time. Uh, the next terms are for the cosine and sine modes, so we will have a sum over the index K. running over the natural numbers. For the cosine mode we will have the conjugate momentum cosine k. We need to multiply this by a cosine k dot which we re-express using the momentum variable so we ha here we have 2 over TL times this momentum. So again, this momentum is squared. And we have to multiply this by 2 over TL. Let me put the TL here. Um, exactly the same for the sine mode. So we have pi sine k squared over tl also times 2 that we put in front here. Okay, that was the first part, this sum over the pairs p times q dot. And now we simply have to subtract the Lagrangian function. And in the Lagrangian function we also need to re-express the q dots in terms of the momenta. So that will be minus for the first term we get TL over 2 and then we have A naught dot squared re-expressed in terms of pi naught. So that is pi naught over TL squared And now we proceed with the rest. So we have minus TL over 4 times the sum running over all natural numbers N. For the cosine mode, again this part will be re-expressed using the momentum variable. So here we have um, 2 over TL times pi cosine K T, the whole thing squared. So this is the A dot cosine K squared uh, minus, and this part does not need to be changed at all. This uses just the coordinate itself. K times 2 pi over L squared times A cosine K squared. So that's the part for the cosine mode. And we have exactly the same 
or analogous expression for the sign mode. Now we just need to clean up our result a little. I've copied it up here. So let's make this look a little bit nicer. Our Hamiltonian function is the following. We can combine this term and this here. So if we square the 1 over TL, this cancels with this and we have an additional TL here. So in the end what remains is half, half of that. So we will have and let me also emphasize the variables that we are using. We have pi naught squared over 2 TL then plus a sum over the natural numbers k for the cosine modes we will combine this term with this term considering also this factor out here so if we square the factor 2 over TL, we get 4 over TL squared. This will mostly cancel with this and will just remain 1 over TL as a factor. And here we have 2 over TL. So 2 over TL minus 1 over TL is 1 over TL remaining. So what, what remains in this case is pi cosine k t squared over tl and similarly for the sine term so pi sine k t squared over TL that means we have also taken care of this one and this one so all that remains are the coordinate terms where we have plus sum over the natural numbers TL over 4 K 2 pi over L squared A cosine K T squared plus term for the sign mode so that's starting to look half decent let's just make it a bit nicer by grouping the terms belonging to each mode together Just as our Lagrangian function, our Hamiltonian has a very nice and simple structure. Apart from some annoying constant factors, we see that our Hamiltonian is a sum over individual terms, one for each of the modes. So we can say that H is a sum running over all the modes M 
with one Hamiltonian term for each mode. This again reflects the fact that our modes do not interact at all. There are no um, interaction terms in the Hamiltonian. The value of the Hamiltonian function is the total energy of the system. So we can say that the total energy is simply the sum of the energy stored in each mode and there are no interaction energies mixing the modes. Since the action of our field does not depend explicitly on time, one can show using Noether's theorem that the total energy H is conserved. That is, H is a constant of integration. It would make the video too long to go through the arguments in detail, but if you want to see how it is derived, please tell me in the comments and I can make a separate video about that. Actually, since the modes act uh, as separate independent physical systems, one can show even more, namely that the energy stored in each mode is constant. For example, we have the energy stored in the zero mode, H0, which is equal to pi naught squared over 2TL. This is constant. And since uh, T and L are just constants, this means that pi naught squared, and because pi naught is assumed to be at least continuous, um, pi naught itself is constant. So the momentum of the zero mode is actually constant, which uh, we have seen already in a different way before by seeing that the acceleration of the zero mode is zero. What does this mean for the K of cosine mode, for example? Here we have that is constant. So we have a multiple of one variable squared plus a multiple of a second variable squared being constant with um, the constant coefficients here being positive. This means that in the plane of these variables, this is the equation of an ellipse. When we draw the coordinate a cosine k on the horizontal axis and its conjugate momentum pi cosine k on the vertical axis, a locus of constant energy for this mode will be an ellipse oriented like this. The state of the mode will be represented by a point on this ellipse satisfying this uh, equation of constant energy and we can also say that the point will move uh, clockwise on this ellipse because positive momenta according to our definition of the uh, conjugate momenta correspond to a positive time derivative of the A coordinate. So our point will move towards pot positive a cos k in the upper half of the diagram and we move towards negative a cosine k in the lower half. This space that is spanned by the coordinates and their conjugate momenta is called phase space. And the curve that the state of the system sweeps out by going through phase space with time is called the phase space trajectory of the system. So let's take a closer look at exactly how our mode moves through phase space. Let's first clean up our equations by defining some rescaled variables. We will define pi cosine k tilde to be pi cosine k 
over the square root of TL and we will define A cosine K tilde to be the square root of TL over 2 times k times 2 pi over L times A cosine k. And with these rescaled variables our equation of constant en energy becomes simply that H cosine k is pi tilde cosine k squared plus a tilde cosine k squared. So now our lines of constant energy expressed in the new um, variables for the mode will simply be circles. So how can we describe the motion of our phase space point on this circle of constant energy? Uh, let's first use the definition of the conjugate momentum to express the momentum variable in terms of the time derivatives of the coordinate. So if we plug the definition in, we get that our new momentum variable is the square root over t square root of TL over two times the time derivative of a cosine k and after I've made some more room here and I've copied over the solution to the equation of motion that we found the last time we can plug this solution in and actually let's for the purpose of this demonstration let's concentrate on the first term because the second term, as we said last time, just represents a solution that is phase shifted in time. So to keep things simple, we will assume that only the first constant of integration is non-zero. So it's straightforward to plug this in in the definition of our coordinate. So here we get square root of TL over 2 times K times 2 pi over L times the constant of integration times cosine of K times T times 2 pi over L and now we plug in the time derivative of the solution here. From the derivative of the cosine we get a negative sign. So we have negative square root of TL over 2. Then also from the, from the derivation of the argument we get a factor of k times 2 pi over L. we get the constant of integration and then from the derivative of the cosine we get negative sine of k times t times 2 pi over L. Now we see that the phase space trajectory has a very very simple behavior with time because it uh, turns out to be just uniform motion along the circle with a constant angular velocity. To show this more clearly let's write the coordinates of our phase space point as a vector with the components a tilde cosine k t and pi tilde cosine kt 
this vector will have a common factor in front that is square root tl square root of tl over 2 times k times 2 pi over l times our constant of integration and then the remaining coordinates will be cosine of an angular velocity omega times t and minus the sine of omega times t which we can also write as sine of minus omega times t and actually since cosine is an even function we can also put the minus here it doesn't change anything and this all is true with omega being equal to k times 2 pi over l this way we've made it very clear that uh, the motion of our phase space point is a, a motion with constant angular velocity omega clockwise due to the minus sign here in phase space with our definition of coordinate axes along the curve of uh, constant uh, energy h cosine k with these formulae we have arrived at the simplest description of the classical motion of the harmonic oscillator that describes our field mode it is a circular motion in phase space with a constant amplitude and a uniform angular velocity. If you are wondering about the effect of the second constant of integration that we have so far neglected, it is the following. The two constants simply combine into the constant amplitude like this and there is a constant shift in phase that depends on the relative magnitude and signs of these integration constants. The amplitude of the phase space motion being constant and the uniform angular velocity suggests that it could be very advantageous for us to use polar coordinates on our phase space. We will not quite do that but we will do something that is very similar and related to it namely we will make use of a fact about complex numbers namely that e to the minus i omega t with i being the imaginary unit and omega and t being real numbers is equal to cosine of minus omega t plus i times the sine of minus omega t. In order to use this we will make a linear transformation to new variables but in contrast to the last time we will this time allow complex coefficients in our linear transformation we define lowercase a cosine k as the momentum pi cosine k tilde of t minus i the imaginary unit times the coordinate a cosine k tilde of t and we make this definition for all k in the natural numbers We will also define a second set of variables 
by forming linear combinations that are linearly independent from these ones. We will call this second set of variables by using negative k as the index. And this a negative k will be defined as the linear combination the momentum pi tilde cos k plus i times the coordinate a tilde cos k. And of course, analogously for the sine mode, I want to emphasize that while these definitions may be motivated by the classical solution to the equations of motion, these definitions do in no way depend upon the equations of motion or generally on the dynamics of our field. This is an important point because we will be using the same variable definitions in the quantum mechanical treatment of the field. So it is important that these do not depend on the classical dynamics. Still, the classical phase space picture gives us an intuitive way to understand the meaning of these lowercase a variables we have just defined. When the variables pi tilde and a tilde take real values as we have so far assumed, pi tilde is equal to the real part of the variable lowercase a. So let's denote it here. So this is the real part of a cos k. And the imaginary part of lowercase a is equal to minus the coordinate a tilde. So um, if we draw that here, the negative a tilde axis would correspond to the imaginary part of a k for cosine mode. So you see that this is just a somewhat 90 degree rotated version of the complex plane here. The complex a cos k plane to be more specific, and we can understand the variable lowercase a cosine k simply as a number in this complex plane. For the classical motion, we can therefore see that our lowercase a cos k will have an absolute value that corresponds to the constant amplitude of the space, phase space trajectory and the argument, the angle with respect to the real axis, will be the uniformly moving phase angle that moves with angular velocity omega with time. This leads to a very nice description of the classical phase space trajectory. We can write that lowercase a cos k that depends on t will simply be the value of a cos k at time zero, which is a complex valued constant of integration, times e to the minus i omega t with omega defined as we had it here. In this way, we are using this identity for the complex exponential function in order to nicely combine the cosine and sine functions of time that appear in the classical solution. Finally, let's take a look at the relation of the variables lowercase a with positive and negative index k as long as pi tilde and a tilde are real valued, 
we have the relation that these expressions are exactly complex conjugates of each other. So we can say that the fact that pi tilde and a tilde are real numbers is equivalent uh, to the fact that a cosine negative k is equal to the complex conjugate of a with positive k. I will use the star to indicate the complex conjugate. In the classical phase space picture, this means we can visualize a cos negative k as the complex conjugated number that would be just the number a cos positive k reflected with respect to the real axis so it has the same absolute value as a with positive k but opposite phase angle and with time it will therefore also move in the opposite anti-clockwise direction. Here I have again summarized our new variable definitions that we make for all natural numbers k together with what we might call the reality conditions that are the conditions that must hold for the variables lowercase a in order to make our variables pi tilde and uppercase a tilde real values. Let's express the Hamiltonian in the variables we are now using. I have copied the Hamiltonian we previously derived here. And in terms of the rescale tilde variables, it takes this somewhat simpler form. Now our task is to re-express this in terms of the lowercase a variables. And in order to do this, we will first invert these variable definitions. That's quite easy. We simply need to add or subtract these two equations and we get the following results, namely the momentum variable pi tilde cosine k can be expressed as one half a cosine k plus a cosine minus k and this holds for all natural numbers k and the coordinate variable uppercase a tilde cosine k t is equal to i over 2 lowercase a cosine k of t minus lowercase a cosine minus k of t also for all natural numbers k and of course the same kind of relations hold for the sign modes and considering our reality conditions, this just says that we can extract the real part, uh, which is the momentum variable, by adding the variable and its, its complex conjugate. And likewise, we can extract the imaginary part by subtracting the variable and its complex conjugate. So let's simply plug these definitions and to our Hamiltonian, there's no change for the zero mode. Now the first thing is we have to square the momentum variable, which gives us a quarter times a 
cosine k squared. By the way, I will now uh, suppress the time argument to make the notation a little lighter. <clears throat> Plus, so the mixed terms are, we have a cosine k, a cosine minus k, and a cosine minus k, a cosine k, plus finally a cosine minus k squared. So this was the pi tilde squared part. And then we have the a tilde squared part. It's quite similar. But the i squared gives us an overall minus sign in front of these terms. So we have minus a cosine k squared. Then the mixed terms are negative, but this cancels with the minus sign from the i squared. So for mixed terms, we get exactly the same as before. And finally, we get the square with the minus sign from the i squared minus a cosine minus k squared. And we get exactly the same for the sine terms, where we just replace cosine with sine. Now you can see that quite a lot of terms can cancel. So a cosine k squared cancels. A cosine minus k squared cancels and we can combine the mixed terms, one half times this. Plus the same thing, replacing cosine with sine. And so far I have um, intentionally not simplified this because now we need to um, use a property that is, that is only true in the classical framework, namely that these are just complex numbers, so they commute with each other. Uh, you see the only difference between this term and this term is the order of the variables. And in the classical framework, this does not matter because all our variables are just complex or real numbers and they, they just commute. So um, classically, and only classically, we conclude the following. Our Hamiltonian is of this form. We have the zero mode energy and then we have a sum over all natural numbers of a minus k cosine. I again introduced the dependence on t here. Ik cosine t plus same thing for the sine modes. And this nice expression is the Hamiltonian in our new variables. We could also plug these inverted definitions back into the Fourier expansion of our field, but at this stage it turns out not to be very enlightening. If you want to try it as an exercise, you will find that our field phi depends only on the imaginary part of our newly defined variables. See you next time when we will finally get rid of this clunky distinction between cosine and sine modes and we will discover left and right moving modes of the field. If you have any questions about the video, please put them in the comments below. See you.